wisdom. So I said, I, I choose wisdom. And immediately, like, and, and but my face kind of uh, started to drop. And the angel went away. And the kids are like, what's wrong? And I was like, I, I now realize I should pick the wealth. <laughs> it, just, it took wisdom to understand. Like, oh man, I wonder what it really helps. Uh, we're getting into the life of Solomon now, and end of life of David. So we're gonna do this this week. Next week, uh, we are uh, gonna kind of do some overview of King David's life, and then uh, we're gonna move on to some other uh, some other passages here for the summer. Uh, but we're going to look at First Kings. I got a lot of just little like snippets from the story to kind of help tie it all together. Am I not on? No, sorry. Uh, to help tie it all together. But we'll begin in First Kings chapter one. We'll finish First Samuel, uh, and now is uh, the kind of the arbitrary breakdown. You know, in, um, in the Jewish scriptures, they, they don't have a break between First Samuel, Second Samuel, First Kings, Second Kings. It's all just the Book of the Kings. Uh, so we put this dividing line in there. Uh, at the mark where, okay, now Solomon's story takes over. Uh, and King David was old and advanced in years. And although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. Therefore his servants said to him, Let a young woman be sought for my lord the king, and let her wait on the king and be in his service. Let her lie in her arms, and my, and, my, and my, excuse me, and my lord the king may be warm. So they sought for a beautiful young woman. Why she had to be beautiful? I don't know, but they were like, yeah. Throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag, the Shuman, uh, the Shunammite, and brought her to the king. The young woman was very beautiful, and she was of service to the king and attended to him, but the king knew her not. Um, so I hate everything about this part of the story. So you're like, why are you... Why are you reading it? I said, well, because there is an important plot point that is being set up here. This, this character does matter here, and it's something that we have seen another couple times throughout First and Second Samuel that I've pointed out a couple times, like, this, I know this seems weird, but this is going to matter in the end. And, and sure enough, it does kind of, you know, all these kind of plot points start coming together. All right, and so this is something that would have been very normal for kings and things like that. Of course, he had dozens of wives and all sorts of concubines and all these things that we look at and you're like, ugh, I don't like any of this. How am I supposed to respect this man? How am I supposed to look at him, uh, you know, positively? And I said, part of it is, it is just a different time. It's a different culture. It is also just kingship is different. You know, they live differently. I think it is part of the warning that God was giving them of like, you don't want kings. Kings are complicated. This is one of those things that's that's complicated. All the people want to do whatever the king wants. That's not really healthy and good. I'm glad it threw out the little piece of the end, the 70 year old man. It's not, he's not doing anything truly inappropriate, but I still kind of feel bad for Abishag. Uh, all right, First Kings chapter one, verse five. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself and says, "I will be king." So this is fourth in line. David had a little thing for a while of naming all his sons a names. All right, you can see how many children he had because who actually becomes king is Solomon. And he goes in alphabetical order. Not as <laughs> All right, in the beginning, you know, we saw, you know, Absalom and Amnon. All right, so this is the fourth oldest king, actually the fourth oldest son, all right, of King David. So you can see the logic. He is the oldest son of David at this point. That would make the most sense that he'd be king. All right, and King David's not dead yet, but the, the plan and the plot is starting to come. He exalted himself, not the Lord. No one else, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen, 50 men to run before him. His father had never at any time displeased him by asking, why have you done thus and so? And he was also a very handsome man. And he was born next after Absalom. He conferred with Joab, the son of Zariah, and of Abathar, the priest. All right, we've, we've seen these characters all throughout. These are very loyal men to King David. These are very loyal men to King David. And they followed Adonijah and helped him. But Zadok the priest 
and uh, Berniah, the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan, the prophet, and Shemai, and Ray, and David's mighty men were not with Adonijah. All right, so as much as there were some loyal men that decided to join in, we can see that, you know, the only reason Joab has any power, the only reason that Abiathar is now this, you know, high priest in this community is because of King David. All right, that their loyalty to King David has been rewarded. But King David's about to die. All right, and when King David dies, who is going to be trusted? Is Joab still going to be the commander of the Lord's army once David's gone? Yeah, probably not. Probably not. And so their siding with Adonijah is showing that they are just looking to keep their positions. And the people that are don't seem as concerned with, like, David's mighty men, there's not a hierarchy there. They're just loyal to David. But they're not looking for any positions, any power. They're not the there's not the mightiest of the mighty men. You know, they're just the mighty, the mighty men. They're not worried about their position in the next you know regime, and so they don't join Abiathar. They're not even invited to join in. Nathan certainly doesn't get invited. Nathan is the prophet that has proclaimed more than once Solomon is going to be the next king of Israel. So you can't invite Nathan. All right, he is the one that is. Put his, like, you know, when you are a prophet and you make a prophecy that doesn't come true, that doesn't end well for you. All right, so Nathan's prophecy is the king Saul will be the next king. Nathan doesn't get invited. Nathan doesn't get invited. All right, and there is, you know, I, I think if I'm trying to draw out a little bit of a, an application out of that, I, might, I don't want to force it too much, uh, but if I'm pulling out something, there should have been something in not only Adonijah, but the people following Adonijah. There's a good group of people that follow him. We'll see them more later in a minute. That if you are afraid to tell, oh, say that the priest. He's a very just faithful priest. Oh, Nathan the prophet. A godly, a clearly seen as a godly prophet in the land of Israel. All right? David's mighty men, the people that are, are seen as valiant work. If you're afraid to tell them, it probably could mean you're doing something wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean that. I think there are times that we don't invite someone to the party because they're just really annoying. All right? And so just because you don't want to invite someone doesn't automatically mean you're doing something wrong. You should just make sure, like, are they annoying because they're right and they're going to be telling me I shouldn't be doing something? Or are they annoying for other reasons? Let me make sure I'm a little bit introspective. There should have been some little alarms. Like, if, if you're going to be the next king, why are you inviting Nathan? Why are you inviting Nathan? The why are all the priests invited? Why are you only inviting the priests that, like, agree with you? And you're not inviting the priests that don't agree with you? There should be some questions that come about and help you recognize, I actually might be doing something wrong here. I actually might be if I if I need to do something in secret, if I need to do something where I kind of have to, oh, I got to act this way around this group of people, this way around this group of people, I'm potentially doing something wrong. In verse eleven, Nathan said to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, "Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Agith, has become king, and David our Lord does not know it?" All right, so he's you know David's old. I don't want to make him seem like he's crazy old because he's like 70. Uh, and I know there's some people in here that will be offended if I try to treat 70 as some like ancient person that has no like mind and figured out what's going on. Uh, uh, I do think a little bit of David's age is showing that he has not, like the last story we just looked at, he was not really faithful. And this is something that we have seen that those in their later years very faithful to God. Uh, in Scripture, again, I don't want to, there's not a promise in Scripture, this is what it is. I'm just saying, when I look at the Old Testament, those that are very faithful yet, you know, live much past age 70. All right? And they're, they're seeing this as a faithfulness. They're being blessed by God. And David not living, even in the, his 80s, is, is showing that he has, there has been some things that he has not been as faithful in following God. And as we were looking at last week with counting you know, doing the census and things like that. Um, so I think that could potentially be an indicator of 
uh, what is, is going on here. Again, Old Testament, what we're looking at where the way that the Old Testament law was set up. I in no way look at in the other senses. I, I tell I've told the story a couple of times of uh, one of the you know godliest, most faithful people I've ever met uh, was a 16-year-old girl in my class, Molly. I uh, you know just love the Lord, love Jesus, uh, had cystic fibrosis, was dead at 16. You know, and so when you look at someone like that, like, wait, was she not faithful? Was she not godly? Oh no, no, no. Um, this was something that you know uh, I, I can almost see the blessing of the Lord. She did not have to suffer and suffer and suffer, and God took her home uh, at a very young age. Uh, I ultimately say as a blessing. Um, to her. So we don't look at just like, well, how old are you? Are? I mean, then we see people like Fidel Castro that live to be like 118, you know? And you're like, how did that happen? What did that happen? So we don't look at these as one to ones, but when we're looking at people in the Old Testament, when we look at the kings, we do seem to see a consistent pattern of if they are very faithful, their, their years are extended, and if they are not as faithful, their years are cut short. And that's kind of what we see in David here. Uh, but Nathan goes to Bathsheba. And says, have you heard? The king doesn't know this. The king doesn't know that Adonijah has declared himself king. But you know it, Bathsheba. You know. Therefore, come, let me give you advice that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Go in at once to King David and say to him, Did you not, my lord the king, swear your servant, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? Why then is Adonijah king? Then while you are still speaking with the king, I also will come in after you and confirm your words. All right, and so here Nathan is going to Bathsheba. It's kind of a reminder that this is, this is imperative. This is to save your life and Solomon's life. If Adonijah is recognized as king, you are going to eliminate anyone who could usurp your throne. All right, so there's no doubt Solomon does not survive this. Most likely Bathsheba doesn't uh, survive this. And so Nathan is like, hey, this is kind of the savior life here. All right. And I have, you know, he is just this prophet. Getting access to the king in his old age isn't always easy. All right, but Bathsheba is going to be able, his own wife, his faithful wife, is going to be able to get uh, to King David no problem. He does. All right. And ultimately, as he shares, she shares everything with him. This is David's response. David's response is, call Bathsheba to me. So she came to the king's presence, stood before the king, and the king swore, saying, as the Lord lives, who has redeemed my soul out of adversity, as I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me. He shall sit on my throne in my place. Even so will I to this day. Then Bathsheba bowed her face to the ground, paid homage to the king, and said, may the Lord King David live forever. All right, and so David goes even a step beyond. He's saying, not only am I going to say when I die, he becomes king, because then I can't, I can't make that happen. He declares Solomon king now. All right, he is saying, nope, even as I live, Solomon is now king. So David does a great, wise thing here. When you die, it's easy to kind of change things. You know, I've heard so many stories over the years. Um, from you know, people in church that you know a, a parent passes away and all the brothers and sisters start arguing about like you changed the will, no, you changed it, you did this, you did that. It, it's it, it's easy to argue over that stuff once they're dead because they can't say well, what did you mean. That's what I mean. So David makes this declaration while he is still alive, and so like, did you mean for Solomon to become king? Yes. Oh, good. David has spoken, <laughs> and so it, it kind of helps. Clear the air. All right, King David says, call to me Zadok, uh, the priest, Nathan the prophet. And if you're wondering, why do I keep pronouncing these names different every time? It's because I don't know. I just say it confidently. You can too. Come to Bible words, come to names. Confident. All right, and Zadok, Zadoki, all right, the priest, and Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. All right, so they came to the king. Uh, so they came to the king. Uh, uh, I uh, came to King, and King said, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and have Solomon, my son, ride on my own mule. Bring him down to Gihon. Let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet there anoint him king over Israel, and blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. All right, and so this is, this is where, again, we see this, this culmination. 
God's promises are coming to fruition. This is something that we see God. This wasn't just Nathan's ideas, Nathan's prophecy. We, we saw the Lord that at, at the end of David and Bathsheba's sin, there is this consequence that the, the child that was born in that sin ends up dying. There is heartache. There is pain. And ultimately says, no, no, no. There is going to be a blessing that comes from this. All right? And when uh, Bathsheba gets pregnant again, he says, look, this child is going to be the next king of Israel. All right? And so this is from the Lord. So we see what the Lord is doing. We see the Lord's plans and purposes. Adonijah, he's got no hope. David, even if he bungled this, even if he had like, I really kind of messed this up, there was no situation in which King Solomon does not become king of Israel. Because God declared it. All right? What we didn't know, all he says is he's going to become king. Is it going to be through all sorts of war, all sorts of chaos, or is it going to be something smooth? And I think this is so often what we can see that, yeah, God's going to accomplish what he's going to accomplish. We start intermixing sin and uh, faithfulness and other you know aspects of that. We can see that what God is going to accomplish ends up coming through lots of heartache and chaos and difficulty and pain and suffering. He's still going to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. And because of David's actions here, and while he's alive declaring and saying, this is what we're going to do. He's riding on my mule. I'm taking the priest, the prophet. You are anointing him king. Not just some random friend, not some general. Who cares if a general anoints someone king? All right, Nathan and Zadok, uh, uh, you know, anointing Solomon king under the word of King David, that is the right call. And it brings the possibility of Peace. And we see it actually, it works. Praise the Lord. All the guests of Adonijah, when they hear this, they're trembling. They arose and each went away to their own house. So they're having like a big party. Uh, but where, I can't remember where they're they, they, they got, They're going up in the north somewhere. They're having this big party. And right when they hear uh, Solomon got anointed king in Gion. All right, riding on King David. This is from King David's own mouth. They're now king. All of a sudden they'll be like, all right, I totally forgot. I got family coming over. And everyone just shh, shh, shh. they do not want to be caught uh, in the room with little, you know, quote unquote king, <coughs> Adonijah. Alright? So they all trouble and went away in their own home. Adonijah feared Solomon. So he rose and went and took hold of the horns of the altar and then was told, and it was told to Solomon, behold, Adonijah fears King Solomon. For behold, he has laid hold of the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear to me, first, that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. And Solomon said, very wisely, If he will show himself a worthy man, not one of his hairs shall fall to the earth. But if wickedness is found in him, he shall not die. This is something that we've seen the Israelites kind of mess up in the past. We saw this, we talked about this a, a couple weeks ago of, you know, Joshua making all these kind of promises without realizing who these different people were. Like, oh yeah, we won't harm you. You're free to be in the land. They realize like, oh, there are actually people that live here in the land. They're not just passing through. Uh, and so Solomon very wisely doesn't say, I promise not to hurt him. He says, oh, listen, if, if he is worthy of nothing will happen to a worthy man. If he is sincere about being my servant and, you know, being humble, nothing's going to hurt. Uh, but if wickedness is found in him, oh, we'll die. <laughs> like, he does not make sure there, there's a wisdom there in that. I'm not making some kind of blanket promise that either makes me a liar or a fool. All right? He is kind of saying, like, yep, yeah, I'm going to kind of handle this, you know, in a wise way. If he really is humble, no problem. He's got nothing to fear. And if he tries to do anything deceptive, uh, you don't get a you don't get a third strike. This was strike one, all right? And we're gonna you know you are not gonna get all the way to the end of this full count, all right? Uh, he was surely dying. And so he sent him, brought him down to the altar, and he came and paid homage to the king Solomon. And Solomon said to him, "Go to your home." So he keeps his word. He comes down, bows before him. You're free to go. No problem. All right, ultimately, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 10, David slept with his fathers. He was buried in the city of David. And that time, David had reigned over Israel for 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron, 33 years in Jerusalem. He became king at 30. That's how we know he's 70. 
Uh, uh, if you were having trouble, follow. I'm doing the math for you here on Mother's Day. What does that mean? Um, so Solomon sat on the throne of David, his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. All right, and this is you know this is the thing that so often what you know kings are always thinking about is you know how long is this particular reign going to last? And it's not just your own life. They didn't just think in terms of their own life, like, okay, well, my sons and my sons' sons and my sons' sons' sons be on the throne. Did we establish something, or is there going to be constant, you know, chaos? And we did see, even in David's life, not only were there, you know, usurpers within his own, you know, his own children usurpers, but there were some outsiders. We were dealing with some outside uh, people trying to take over the throne. And so, you know, these, these kind of times of transition are always nerve-wracking. You know, this past, you know, about four years ago, we had, you know, kind of chaos as we were passing on um, from, the pre from one president to the next. I have a feeling this upcoming January we're going to deal with the same kind of some chaos. I don't think it's going to all be just very smooth. I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm making a prediction now. I'm going to be a prophet. There are going to be upset people. At the end of the election, <laughs> you know, and I think those upset people are going to show how upset they are, you know, and and this is something that it might be a little newer to us or a little more visceral. Maybe we're just reporting a little bit more in recent. Years. This is super common everywhere in the world. Like any time there's a transition of power, there always is these little moments of. You know, is the you know is the military going to side with the new leader? Is the judicial people going to side with the new leader? And other countries constantly go through kind of coups all the time because you know there's these big branches of the government and they side with different people and they have to coalesce the government. And we have been relatively blessed over the last few hundred years to see relatively easy transitions of power uh, that will come to an end at some point. I don't know when. I don't know if it's a year from now or uh, 40 years from now or 400 years from now, but it's not going to last forever. The United States is a baby, baby country. We are babies. Uh, you know, when you go to other parts of the world and you start seeing the age of buildings and the age of things, and you'll be like, you know, I like to point out to students, like, that's older than America. You know, <laughs> uh, we went to a tattoo shop in, um, in Jerusalem. They had stamps that they used for their tattoos, and they had three or four stamps that were older than America. <laughs> the oldest stamp they had was made in the 1300s, and they still used it. Right? A stamp from the 1300s. Grace Collins has that tattoo, and that stamp is a 1300s. That's older than America. All right? So we're relatively new. We're not like, we're like, we're the best at this. Like, you're a teenager. Like, teenagers just think they're the best at everything. You know, <laughs> so like there is challenge here. So when David sees as he is dying, there is peace. You know, this is a blessing. This is amazing. This is unique. Uh, as uh, his kingdom is firmly established, there is not some other close contenders. There's not a big battle and fight. Like he becomes, he dies, and everyone's like, Solomon's king, right? Yeah. Alright? Okay, we're good. <laughs> we're good. And then move on. Well, kind of. <laughs> Three verses later. Adonijah, the son of Agith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and says, Do you come peace peacefully? And he says, Peacefully, absolutely peacefully. Then he says, oh, I have something to ask for you. And I don't know what you call your dad's other wife. Aunt Bathsheba? Ah. Um, so, hey, stepmom, I, I have something to ask you here. Speak. You, you know the kingdom was mine, okay? The, the kingdom was mine there for a minute, and that all Israel expected me to reign. However, the king has turned about and become my brother, for it was for the Lord. I, I just have one request to make of you. Do not refuse me. And she says, speak. Doesn't promise, but says speak. And he says, please ask King Solomon. He will not refuse you to give me Abishag, the Shunammite, as my wife. Bathsheba hears this and is like, all right, yeah, that seems, seems reasonable. Sure, yeah, you need a wife. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very well. I will speak to you for the king. 
All right? And this is, this is Solomon's response to this question. She goes and asks him. He says, all right, you, oh, he wants to marry Abishag? Therefore the Lord lives, and it was established me and placed me on the throne of King David, and it was made in his house. He was promised Adonai to be put to death today. What? Why? Yeah, it seems like, what just happened? Did, did I skip anything? I can skip some verses. But we don't actually get why. You have to sit there and think about it, and you have to see what has happened in the past. And uh, that's why I said, like, all these things are kind of starting to make sense. Okay, this is why Solomon turned. Remember he said, listen, he's got, if he comes humbly, no problem. Not a hair on his head will be uh, harmed. But if he shows wickedness, he's going to die. And when he gets this request from his mom saying, like, hey, listen, I was talking to Adonai today, and he would love to marry Abishag. All right, she's a young single woman. All right, no one to take care of him. He'd love to marry her. And his response is, oh, okay, yeah, uh, Adam is just going to die today. And he sets him to death and he's killed. All right? And the reason is, we saw this play out all right, a couple different times with both Absalom and that Benjamin that tried to take over the kingdom. The first thing that they did was take the concubine of King David and sleep with them. In the second case, they slept with like publicly, they took 10, all 10 of his concubines and slept with them publicly outside. It is this show of dominance. It's this display of, see, I have taken over the kingdom and I'm proving it by sleeping with the king's handmaids, sleeping with the king's, you know, uh, you know, sleeping with the king's concubines. You wouldn't do that to a wife that would be seen as, you know, against the laws. That would be seen as getting a kid sleeping with another man's wife. But concubines don't have those same protections under the law. So you sleep with them to show that, like, I'm the captain now. Uh, and what he's doing here, everyone knows that Abishag is not only, he didn't play with her, so she's uh, still a virgin, she's still elderly married, can still become a queen. All right, she doesn't have to stay a concubine. She can become a queen. All right, but everyone knows that she was taking care of King David, and him marrying her is his claim to the throne. That, look, I have taken over this last little vestige that was seen as my father's. This was my father's possession, and now it's mine. And so I am taking over. And we saw this, we, we saw these little like these little breadcrumbs laid out before the scriptures kind of mentioning, like, why would he do that? Why would he sleep with the concubines? Why would they sleep with the handmaids? Why would they do that? And then it kind of makes sense here that this is, and Solomon sees this. Solomon knows this is what you're doing. There are a million women that you can marry. You can marry anybody you want. You're a prince, you know? And like there are so many. Go throughout the village. You're gonna find some, you know, like, oh, like here, we. Take your hair out of a ponytail, take your glasses off. <gasps> She's all that. Alright? And like, bring her to the kingdom. Alright? Like, this is like there, you got your choice of anyone. And you want Abishai. And I know why. Because you're trying to take over the kingdom. And, and Solomon is very wise and ends up executing Adonijah at the end of that. Okay, so this is uh, this is the story. This is where we want to conclude. But I got some other little verses here to kind of bring out some big picture stuff when I think about vacation. Application number one is God is super cool. God is super cool. Uh, I love the verses, these great couple great verses here, Genesis 50, 20. You know, what man meant for evil, God meant it for good, to bring it about that many should be kept alive as they are today. Romans 8 28 kind of even bringing even more positive spin on this for believers today. And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purposes. We're, we're, you know, when we're in the midst, like if, if you kind of try to drop yourself in the middle of any of these stories and kind of try to picture, like if I'm a fly on the wall watching this, it's all a, a bloody, gross, rated R, you know, can't film everything that we read there, you know, and keep it PG Bible movie. All right. Like we, we see this and it's just like, this is so messy. This is so, uh, there's so much just pain and suffering and death and destruction and heartache. It's when we get to read it over a thousand foot view as you're just reading scripture and you're seeing this all just kind of play out. You know what we see? We see God making a promise and keeping a promise. 
all the way back to even when it came to, you know, Bathsheba and David came together because of sin. He's saying, like, but there is going to be this blessing that comes out of it, King Solomon. King Solomon is a, a major bright spot uh, that we don't get another one for a long time. After King Solomon, we do not get any good stories in for the Israel. Like no, no happy stories. All right, there are no happy stories until like maybe Daniel. <laughs> you know, we get a cool story with Elijah, but that's a lot of just death and destruction because everyone's being disobedient. He's depressed all the time. Um, but like all these stories are like. <sighs> Like, it's all bad news and until we start saying, like, okay, God is going to restore them back to the, to the kingdom. So King Solomon is this little bright spot, but he came from, you know, a union that we would probably look at and say, that should have never happened. And, and there's going to be lots of things in our life that we would look at and say, yeah, you know, like, objectively, that shouldn't have happened. I wish that didn't happen. It's sinful that this happened. But then we kind of fast forward and like, yeah, but this blessing happened because of that kind of this blessing happened. Because, this blessing happened. You know, Solomon is this blessing that happens. And I'm like, okay, you know, what man meant for evil, God meant for good. To bring about to keep people alive. Is they were like, we know that God works things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And, and we just gotta be constantly reminded that, yeah, God's cool. God does some cool stuff. You know, he, he's playing this long game. We are so concerned with the mo in the moment. And he is bringing about these, these big praises that, you know, we can think back on, reflect on, praise him for. Um, but he does some cool stuff. Uh, so don't forget his promises. 2 Peter 3, 9, important verse. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. Some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance. You know, the, the idea here of anytime God seems slow in, in actually fulfilling what he promises, he's not slow. Uh, he is kind of waiting for people to repent. He is waiting for things to come. Whenever God chooses to return, to judge the earth, it is not because he has taken, it's been like 2,000 years now, what's going on? He's like, uh, that's, that's, that's not slow. He's actually been pretty quick in the scheme of the universe. It's, he's waiting for people to repent. He, he's waiting for things to align. But he is patient for the good of mankind, not its detriment. <laughs> Second Timothy 2.13, I love these verses, so important. I always just want to find excuses to bring about, uh, to bring about. If we are faithless, he re he. If, if we are faithless, he remains. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So even when we are faithless, he's faithful. Even when we aren't following the the promises of God the way we should, God still keeps His promises. All right. Um, you know, I've always, um, you know, when I look at King David there at the end of his life, and I'm like, ah, man, I don't. You know, I don't like some of these latter stories, but, you know, even though maybe he went a little senile, maybe he went a little this, he went a little that, God kept all his promises to David. God's, David's in heaven, there's no, we're not questioning that by any means. Why? Because God promised him, and that's going to come to fruition. Like, the promises that God makes always delivers on. Um, and that is something to always just be praising God for. Always look at what God is promising. You know, a lot of the Old Testament stories are confusing or weird. We're trying to figure out, like, there were a couple times in the last couple weeks that I was like, I don't know if that was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. I'm kind of unsure. Because anytime we're looking at humans, it's kind of hard to figure that out sometimes. What isn't hard to figure out is what God is doing and what God wants and what God desires. Like, He is really clear about that. And when He makes a promise, we can always know he's going to fulfill it. Um, lastly, despite my little joke in the beginning that 75% of you got, the other 25% started giggling because other people were. Um, wisdom is underrated. Wisdom is underrated. In James 1 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. There are a couple things in Scripture that are, if you ask for, he promises to give it to you. 
Salvation is one of those things. If you, you know, pray and believe that Jesus died for your sins, ask forgiveness for your sins, you ask him to save you, period in the story. There is not, there is no waiting period. There is no like, well, no. Uh, you know, I say yes to some and no to some. God is faithful to answer. This is, this is another one. It's about three or four times that we can look at Scripture and says he promises to give you something. If you are praying to God for wisdom, he promises to give it to you. He promises. All right? It's already showing some wisdom to ask for wisdom. All right? And so he is promising. You're like, you got it right now. The, the wisest thing you could have done would be ask God. You already did that. Um, it's kind of like the, you, you had courage all along, right? Uh, you know, like the idea of that you need, like wisdom, that beginning of wisdom, fear of the Lord, beginning of wisdom, the idea of, let me kind of ask God, let me, let me, let me think about what God might want me to do here. There's great wisdom in that, but I think it goes beyond that. I don't think that's just like, you have all you need now, son. I think this is something that God absolutely starts blessing you with wisdom. He says, yep. You keep talking to me, keep interacting, I am going to give you my wisdom. This is the, the beauty, the, the value of the Holy Spirit, is that his spirit is communing with our spirit, and so we actually can know what God would want in a certain situation. There is no way the Bible could lay out every single scenario that was going to happen. The Bible would have to be like writing about like computer codes and AI and things like that. People would be reading this for thousands of years like, what the heck is this thing talking about? You know, it's because God couldn't give us every scenario. So when he says, I'm going to give you my spirit, he's going to be with you everywhere you go. I'm going to give you these principles, what it is to follow me, obey me, love me. And then when you come to difficult decisions to make, you know, now you get to sit there and start praying. My spirit is going to commune with you, giving you wisdom on how to handle different situations. Proverbs 3.13, blessed is one who finds wisdom, the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver, and her profit better than gold. The her there is wisdom, um, Sophia. Uh, the idea of wisdom from the Lord is oftentimes in the Old Testament new brought out in a feminine terms. Um, you know, they have you know, masculine and feminine words, and wisdom is a feminine word. Maybe there's some wisdom. And that. Maybe there was some reason God did that. Uh, but the, the big key here is kind of saying, like, to see, you know, there are there are people that you know gain all sorts of money from all sorts of different things. They start some great business, they get inherit some money, they win some kind of lottery. All right? We know these stories all the time. You know, but fifty percent of people that win the lottery are bankrupt within a year, within three years, whatever the number is. It's because you can get a lot of gold not having wisdom <laughs> on how to use it. Uh, my favorite stat is that the greatest number of millionaires in this country are teachers. There are more millionaire teachers than any other profession in the United States. Why? Because, uh, it's not because they made a lot, it's because the wisdom that many teachers have, not all, wisdom many teachers, I'm going to set a little bit aside, I'm going to put in a 401k, I'm going to do it, and they... You know, they basically are poor their whole life, but they're smart about putting money in their 401k, and then that's actually how most people in America, most people in America become millionaires through their retirement fund, not through any other means. And teachers are more faithful in their retirement fund than any other profession. All right? And so they're like, huh, oh, there's actually a little bit of wisdom uh, that we actually see playing out over a 40-year period uh, can actually work out. So the, the value that... You can have, you can see that wisdom is far greater than any just silver or gold that jumps out of um, nowhere. Wisdom is underrated. We see this in King Solomon's life. If you read those next couple stories that I had to cut out, there are people, there are other characters that we've seen that some of these characters he brings into the fold, some of these characters he kills. Right? And what we get to see is that over and over again, he makes the right call. He makes the right call. He seems to be not only communing with the Lord to make these right calls, all right, that he has this great gift of wisdom and discernment, wisdom being, uh, you know, knowledge with application. So I know this right thing to do, and I'm actually applying it in a proper way. And we see uh, Solomon's life of blessings coming from 
the wisdom that he shows that he surrounds himself with actually good, loyal people, wise people. He is acting in a way that actually prevents future wars and difficulties breaking out. You know, we don't see any other king throughout Israel's history actually interacting with other kings in a positive way. So when you, if you continue reading on uh, through First Kings uh, and beyond, you're going to see that like every other judge that we see before there were kings, all the kings, they're only fighting with other people. They're, they're fighting with the Philistines. They're fighting with Egypt. They're fighting with uh, the Ammonites and the Amalekites. They're fighting with everybody. And Solomon's the first time that we start seeing him not fighting with other kings. That he actually figures out how to do trades and actually like they work together uh, with you know the queen of Sheba and the king of Tyre. All right, they actually start working like oh wow. Somehow the the wisest king actually figures out how to avoid conflict when the other kings couldn't figure out how to do that. That's wisdom. That's wisdom, and it is it is severely severely. Uh, underrated. It's something that we should see as a real blessing. Surround yourself with people that show wisdom. Be praying and desiring more wisdom in your life. Let's pray together. Jesus, we are uh, thankful for these different examples that we get here in Scripture. We pray that we can learn from destructive behaviors. We can learn from things like desiring power and usurping power, that we can learn from things uh, like what it really means to be humble versus conniving. We can learn from things uh, of the value of wisdom, but more than any of that, Lord, I pray that we can just see your faithfulness in everything. That we can see your, uh, your goodness, your promises, your faithfulness. Uh, it is this one constant that we get in the midst of all these different chaoses. Um, we love you and praise you for this, the patience you show in our life. Uh, we pray we can surround ourselves with, with more people to bring wisdom uh, into our life, that we pray that we can really desire your wisdom first and foremost. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Ladies, we'd love for you to get more.